live or anything where they can put questions in there for you, Kara. So yes. that's a, a, another option then too. Perfect. All right. So the social and emotional impact of stem cell transplant. We're going to, um, hold on. There we go. So uh, I'm going to start with uh, just going through, you know, the preparing for the stem cell transplant. So as you will learn, if you haven't gone through yet, uh, there is a lot of preparation that the body needs to go through. Uh, the transplant is actually replacing cells that are damaged by disease or chemotherapy. And, you know, our patients go through many rounds of chemotherapy to clear their body and wipe the immune system. So we refer to that a lot as creating a, a clean slate. So you're thinking about, you know, when a child is first born and their immune system is completely fresh and clean. And that's really what we're doing with our patients, too. Uh, and with that, you know, the immune system will need to rebuild and restore itself. Uh, transplants are provided for a number of different uh, cancers, leukemia, lymphoma, neuroblastoma, and multiple myeloma, are some of the most common ones. Um, when the, the body is wiped clean with this clean, clear slate, what it, like I said, you know, our immune system really, uh, it can be compromised. So our patients, and I'll talk about that a little bit more too, you know, tend to isolate a little bit more, try to protect themselves uh, that much further just to make sure that they aren't exposed to anything that could cause any harm. And then certainly too, there are three uh, types of transplant, the autologous, which is the stem cell that come from you, the patient. So you're basically your, your own donor. Uh, the allogenic are from a donor, and then the uh, syngenic are the stem cells that come from an identical twin. So that's a little bit rarer. Uh, we usually see them coming from a donor or from the patients. Uh, Alexandria? Yes. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I'm, I, part of the slides are cut off at the end. I don't know if it's just my view or if the participants, if you're seeing some cut off. No, I, I can see it. You can see it all. Okay, it must be my view. Ignore me then. I think we should be okay. okay. And I can send you the slide deck if you need to put it in somehow too. Perfect. I do have it, so we should be good. Thank you. Okay. Yep, no problem. Okay, so my role with the, the behavioral health team is really for the, the preparing the mind part. So we do all the psychosocial assessments uh, done prior to transplant. And this is actually an insurance requirement for transplant and actually a nice way too for us to really get a feel for our patients. You know, we look at, you know, how their support system is, you know, if they have a history of depression or anxiety, what they have in place for coping skills. And certainly if there's any social service concerns, you know, how housing, finances, um, caregiver worries. Uh, we have a lot of people that say, okay, I'm going to go through this transplant. I'm the main breadwinner for my family and I'm going to be on disability. And so we'll assist them to making sure that, you know, they're working with the social worker and getting their FMLA paperwork all in place. Uh, the coping skills is a big piece that I talk with them about just because there is an extended hospital stay. You know, there's, you know, one week prior to transplant typically, and then two to three weeks post-transplant. However, that can be extended. Uh, I actually have a patient right now who uh, went through a transplant and his numbers just aren't coming up as quickly as they'd like. So everything still looks good. It's just that patience with the body. And so going back to that coping skills piece, I always ask them, okay, if you're going to be in an isolated room, um, by choice, but not feeling like it's so much of a choice just because you are recovering, what do you have in place that will help you pass that time? And the majority of people, you know, they have hobbies. I, I had um, one patient say, well, I have all these books I've been meaning to read, so I'm going to get through all of them. I had another one that actually did the assessment for last week that asked, can I have my computer with me? And I said, yes. I'm like, do you guys have internet? And I said, yes. And he's like, all right, that's all I need. Uh, so I follow that up too with, okay, well, when you get tired of staring at the computer screen all day, what else do you have? So a lot of the patients will bring, you know, a deck of cards or some sort of craft, things like that. And uh, oftentimes, even when I've asked them about that, they say, wow, I didn't even really think about that piece because I've just been preparing for the process. So I like to plant that seed ahead of time so that they start thinking too of, okay, what am I going to do to pass this time? Because these four walls are going to start caving in on me a little bit after a while. 
Uh, and then certainly too, isolation is uh, something that we look at, you know, due to the compromised immune system from having that cleared out body. And we have a lot of uh, patients that will start limiting their visitors to decrease the risk of catching anything. Uh, quite a few of them too will ask, you know, can I be around my kids or my grandkids? Because we know that little kids especially are little petri dishes so it's looking at you know the safety precautions that we had even during the pandemic and saying okay well what do you need in place to make you feel safe and secure as you're you know preparing for this and then certainly too there are side effects of transplant so fatigue and weakness are big ones i think that's uh, fatigue especially is a main side effect from the majority of our cancer treatments. And then certainly to those flu-like symptoms, uh, just nausea, changes in your taste, the digestive system changing, there's a, a lack of appetite, you'll notice the sleep patterns different, pain, uh, hair loss from the chemo, uh, skin reactions, uh, fertility or sexual changes, uh, muscle weakness, and then certainly graft versus host disease. So graft versus host disease occurs with our allogenic transplants. So that's when you're getting the, the donor uh, is not yourself. And, you know, the white blood cells from your, your donor, the graft, uh, see the cells in your body, the host, as foreign and start to attack them. Uh, this problem can cause damage to your skin, liver, intestines, and many other organs. Um, it can also be acute, uh, which has an onset within 100 days of your transplant, or chronic, which usually happens within two years. And this can be treated with steroids or other drugs to suppress your immune system. So it is treatable uh, and definitely something that, you know, that the teams are always aware of. Uh, the, there's some great ways to help reduce that. And, it, you know, the closer your donor stem cells match yours, the less likely you will have this. Uh, your doctor can also give you drugs to suppress the immune system, especially right after transplant, so that uh, this is less likely to occur. Uh, and then um, donated stem cells can be treated uh, to remove the white blood cells that are called T cells, and that is what causes the graft versus host disease. So this process is called the T cell depletion. And they will, you know, your your doctor and medical staff will look at all those risk factors too as they're they're going through and preparing you for your transplants. So the impact after transplants, uh, there's a lot of mixed emotions. You know, certainly all the unknowns, the unpredictability of the cancer, the added stress of having precautions, even just that idea, especially, you know, if you had the donor transplant saying, okay, we're in the clear, I didn't get this, you know, within 100 days, but, you know, is this still an option for that graft versus host? And, you know, all those things are, can live in the back of our minds and cause a little bit more stress. Uh, even the idea of feeling trapped, you know, you might be stuck at home, you're used to being very busy, and now you're limited just because you're waiting for the body to fully recuperate. And, you know, the isolation that I talked about earlier, too, uh, you know, staying away from people, fear of catching something, uh, even avoiding uh, loved ones or events. Uh, and that really, you know, makes you miss out on a lot of things. Uh, even just a sense of pa panic. I've had some patients that have noticed since their transplant an increase in their anxiety or that that fear of, okay, is it taking? Uh, you know, am I going to have to go through this again? How's my immune system? And unfortunately, you know, we don't have little doors inside us that we can open up and say, oh, that's the, the immune system. It's working. I see all those little pathways going along. Uh, and then certainly two changes in sleep. You might be sleeping more or less, you know, as your body's recuperating, it causes fatigue and it's finding that balance uh, between, you know, the fatigue where your body needs that rest and the fatigue from inactivity. And that's a very fine line to really uh, distinguish. Uh, some unhealthy habits might start to arise, especially if you're not doing your daily routines. So you might get out of, you know, the habit of working out or going for walks uh, as a result of that isolation. You might find that you're starting to eat more or eating unhealthy things um, out of boredom. 
And of course, there's the worry, concern over recovery, exposure, uh, worried for loved ones. You know, is someone else in my family going to have to go through this? Is this something that's, you know, genetic? And, you know, what other tests can I do? Uh, we have a lot of patients uh, that have become more hyper vigilant about wanting to make sure that everything is okay for their kids or their grandchildren so that they don't have to experience the same thing. And certainly grieving. So there's a lot of losses or missed opportunities that can happen too, especially as you're preparing and you're limiting your activities uh, just so that there isn't a, a grave impact on your health. I talk with a lot of my patients too when they're looking at, you know, isolating or staying away and saying, okay, well, you know, do that within reason. You know, are you, you know, denying yourself going to a basketball game where you can sit on the bleachers away from yourself, but still with the group? Uh, versus, you know, going to a concert where people are tripping over each other. So it is making those decisions and saying, well, what safety precautions can I put in place so I can still be there to support uh, my loved ones or, or be involved in, you know, that birthday party or whatever it might be. There's certainly an impact on the mind and body. So there's changes in your physical activity, as I mentioned, uh, feeling helpless, defeated, hopeless, uh, headaches, body aches. You know, the mood and cognitive disruptions uh, and certainly perspective changes. You know, we uh, have a lot of, you know, plans for our future. And then when you get a diagnosis such as cancer, it puts things in a different light. And you say, okay, well, is that really important or should I be focusing elsewhere? You know, and there's, you know, that visceral response with your body. So you'll find that there's a lot of different uh, reactions that way too. You know, your breathing might change, your stomach might go into knots. So it's really paying attention to all those subtle things that happen. And certainly to the vicarious trauma. Uh, I've had a lot of patients that as they're talking with other patients or even the caregivers of patients, and they find that they start kind of taking on their story or having intrusive thoughts or, or fears uh, from what they've they've heard. And you know, and it's it's totally fine to have that support, but it's also for yourself knowing when to take a step back so that you can, you know, make sure that you're taking care of yourself as you're navigating through. And certainly the stress response. So a lot of times people think that, you know, stress is, you know, that tightness in your shoulders, which it absolutely is. That's more of the physical piece. But, you know, we really find that stress affects the body, mind, emotions, and behaviors. So you're going to see a lot of changes um, when that stress level increases. And when stress increases, our immune system decreases. So again, going back to those coping skills that I always ask people about in their psychosocial assessments, it is looking at what you have in place for that stress management and paying attention to the responses that your body has. And knowing that stress isn't just in your head, it impacts you systemically uh, and it's that biochemical release. You know, that, that cortisol that goes to our brains and the time of stress to keep us alert when we're driving in traffic or trying to get through the airport uh, to catch a flight. You know, that's something that you know, we need to stay alert and active. However, too much stress and keeping it firing all the time actually causes, you know, the cognitive changes too. So it is looking at, okay, how do I catch my breath in this? What can I do to help, you know, recuperate? Uh, and you might find too, as your stress increases, that you have more nightmares or trouble sleeping and increase in anxiety, uh, feeling emotionally raw. Those are a lot of common things that um, quite a few of my patients have talked about. Uh, so it is you know, looking at, okay, when all these things are happening, what do I need, need to do to take that step back? And that you know, transitions us to the sleep hygiene too. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when that sleep is interrupted, we aren't functioning very well. So it's looking at what is interrupting my sleep at night? You know, are there distracting noises? Is my mind racing? Does it, I, I refer to it as the monkey mind. <laughs> We're jumping from thought to thought to thought without really processing anything. Uh, snoring bedmates, uh, even uh, tinnitus. I've had quite a few patients after chemo that say they have the ringing in their ear that keeps them up. And you know, it's really hard when there is a physical thing happening in your body. 
So we work a lot with our patients too on finding things to help alleviate that. You know, so setting a sleep schedule is really great. Having no technology in the bedroom. I know a lot of people say, well, I use my phone for my alarm. So it's saying, you know, if you if you need to bring it in, then make sure that you're not looking at the screen for at least a half hour before you go to bed. And that's really to cut down the stimulation to your brain. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you know, I just have the TV on, but my eyes are closed. Well, those flashing lights are keeping your brain active. And if you're hearing noises from the TV or even the radio music with uh, with different words and lyrics, your brain is still processing that. So you don't actually get to that REM cycle until that stuff shuts off. Uh, or if it doesn't, if it's playing all night, then you, you don't really get to that recuperative cycle. And then certainly to controlling the room temperature. So if it's too hot or too cold, you're not going to get a good night's sleep either. I actually had a lot of people uh, talking even today from, you know, the temperature changes we've been having recently that they're not sleeping as well because they have their winter blankets on for those cold days, but, you know, it, it's a little bit more mild. So they're trying to figure out the best temperature so that they can adjust their body accordingly. And when you're going through treatment, especially, you know, the chemo, at, it adjusts your body too. So it's hard to predict when you're going to be hot or cold or what else is happening inside there. So when we do get good sleep, a lot of those benefits are, you know, boosting your brain activity. You're going to concentrate better. Your immune system is going to be a lot stronger. Of course, you're going to be more energetic and able to function, get, you know, your 10,000 things done that you wanted to do that day. And it lifts your spirits, uh, higher productivity. Uh, so it's definitely a beneficial thing. And I, I tell a lot of my patients too, it's not so much about trying to force yourself to get, you know, eight hours of sleep. It's just making sure that when you do get sleep, it's refreshing when you wake back up. I had a, a patient actually I was talking to earlier today and she said, I get six hours of sleep and then I, you know, take a, a nap for a couple hours during the day. And I asked her if she felt that she was recuperated after then. She said, yeah. Sometimes I just feel like my body rested. My mind might not have shut off, but my body felt rested. So that's also something to consider is, okay, if I can't really get that sleep, what can I do to help my body feel rested as it's recuperating? And then, you know, the concerns about going out. So I always, you know, recommend, especially after you know, patients have gone through some intense chemo, definitely after the transplant, is using those safety precautions. I mean, one of the great things that the pandemic did was made people more conscious of, are we washing our hands? Are we, you know, doing the protective things? Uh, I, I mentioned earlier that I've been with uh, City of Hope for 15 years. When I first started working with stem cell, we had a lot of our patients that were wearing the mask in the airport, and they would always comment about how people were looking at them weird and didn't understand, you know, why they needed to wear a mask to protect their immune system. And since, you know, we went through everything, the pandemic, it's, less judgmental, I feel, you know, you know, people can travel through the airports and go in the grocery stores and there's people with masks and people without them, but there's not so much of a, why is that person wearing a mask? Because we have an understanding of, okay, this person needs to protect themselves. Uh, you might also find that there's lifestyle changes, you know, that hesitation to engage in activities or staying away from larger groups, uh, restricting visitors or time. And all those things are okay. Uh, we certainly don't want our patients to become hermits. But we also understand the importance of feeling comfortable or saying, okay, I can spend a half hour at this event and then I'm going to go. Or, you know, I, I really like to limit, you know, the amount of people that are around me. And then certainly being aware of your body responses. So taking a deep breath is a great way to help you refocus, calm your mind and connect back to your body. Uh, we practice a lot of mindfulness, which is you know, staying present with yourself. So I always I give my patients the very easy task of saying, okay, well, when you're sitting in a room, just look around it and you know, kind of go through your senses. So what are some things that you can see? What are some things you can hear? Uh, you know, what are you smelling? Or can you taste anything? Um, what, what can you touch? Is there different fabrics or even how is your body touching, you know, the chair that you're sitting on? And that's a really nice way to 
cut out the outside distractions that might be going through and just bring you back into the present moment. Especially if you feel overwhelmed or anxious, that's a wonderful way to be able to take a time out and just reconnect with you. So I'm going to transition into our intimate relationships that also get impacted by transplants. Uh, fertility and sexuality. So there can be a temporary or permanent uh, infertility. So we always recommend, especially for our younger patients going through transplant, to have conversations prior uh, about looking at preservation options, just to be sure. We actually partner a lot with Northwestern Oncology Fertility. And what we like about their facility is where they store the specimen ships worldwide. So I always tell our patients that, you know, if you get a job and you're moving to London or New Zealand and you decide, okay, now I'm going to start a family, your specimen can go there too. So you don't have to worry about coming back to a certain uh, place to do it. And especially too, since they specialize with oncology care, you know, there's, you know, insurance coverage, of course, um, and they do have discounts for cancer patients. But it's also just a nice way to know that they understand the process that you're going through. Uh, and we also know that, you know, there's a lot of um, changes that can happen with the body. Certainly as you're going through chemo, there's, you know, the hair loss, skin rashes, swelling, weight loss or gain, uh, and definitely the decrease in sexual desire. I always uh, talk with patients uh, about that piece and they say, well, your body is in survival mode when you're fighting cancer. So if you think about if you're in the woods and you're with your partner and a bear comes up, you're not thinking about let's um, like expand uh, the the uh, population and procreate. We're thinking about how can we survive and what do we need to do to get away from this bear? That's that stress response, that fight or flight mode. And certainly as you're going through cancer, that is at the forefront of your mind is what do I need to do to get over this so that I can be here for the long term? Uh, and with that too, you know, those intimacy changes. So we've had a lot of partners that are hesitant to touch their patients because they're afraid that they're gonna cause pain or, you know, increase the pain that they're already in. Uh, and we always, you know, recommend that you get to know your own body again and what you find is pleasurable and enjoyable. Uh, I've had quite a few people say, you know, I used to love just having massages and now my body aches so much. It's like pins all over the place when my partner touches me. And, you know, I asked um, one patient, I said, well, you know, is there a place that that doesn't happen? And she goes, my ankle. I'm like, great. So why don't you start there and see if that can help um, relax your body and even just work up the leg a little bit and looking at the extremities and just get to know what uh, does feel comfortable. It's certainly having conversations with your partner. That's a one thing that a lot of our, our patients are hesitant to do. And even our caregivers, they'll say, well, I don't want to bother them with this. And you will meet with them, them separately. And they both say that. And then we bring them together and say, okay, well, you don't want to bother them with this. And they don't want to bother you with this, but it's both weighing on both of you. So what can we do to bring you together so that you, know, you can have that conversation where it's not a wait anymore, but it's a dialogue where you can come up with a solution together. And, uh, and of course, too, sex should never be painful. And that that's a big thing that in our sexual health program that we talk about with our patients. Uh, we've had quite a few that say, okay, well, I'm just going to grin and bear it. And we say, please don't do that, uh, because that can cause a lot more damage. And uh, certainly, too, uh, you know, going back to the graft versus host disease, that um, does impact us. And I think that's, yep, that's actually our, our next slide here. So the genital graft versus host disease, it impacts women more than men, but it certainly uh, can impact both. Uh, for women, uh, it's seen usually within seven to 10 months of the transplants and 56% of women will experience that. And that can show up as red patches or superficial inflammation in the genital area, bleeding or pain during intercourse, uh, vaginal narrowing or obstruction, uh, it can interfere with urination. Uh, there might be vaginal itching, burning, or dryness. So we really recommend pelvic floor rehab to reduce the symptoms along with vaginal hydration. 
And those are things just for your overall sexual health too. So I always tell people, you know, even if you're not having penetrative sex, um, you know, for our women, they, they need to have that so that when they have a pelvic exam, it isn't painful. And, you know, definitely if there's any of the narrowing, there's dilator training that can be done to help expand that area and make it more comfortable. And then for our men, uh, the penile graft versus host disease, again, there's, you know, the changes in the skin color. Uh, definitely on the, the head of the penis, there's redness or white lines, uh, burning or pain, uh, the scarring on the foreskin or adhesions, um, pain when interacting with the foreskin. So again, if there's having penetrative sex, it's going to be really uncomfortable. And that too can cause it, you issues with urination. Uh, the topical steroids are usually the treatment for, for the men. And then for both, it's wearing loose, you know, cotton or cotton lined underwear, or washing the area with warm water, and certainly talking with your physician first, especially when you first notice those signs to address it right away so that it doesn't get to be a bigger issue. So uh, moving into coping, uh, I know I mentioned that a few times that uh, definitely needing to practice those self-care techniques. Uh, we offer counseling for all of our patients because we know all of those changes and things that I was talking about can really impact you. And a lot of times too, we don't realize it until we're on the other side of treatment. You know, mentally we're, you know, in that fight or flight, that go mode of I need to do everything I possibly can to fight this cancer. And then once you're on the other side, it's saying, wow, I really went through a lot or now I'm, I'm looking in the mirror and I, I look different. I feel different. I, I don't feel connected to myself. So that's really where we encourage people to make sure that they, you know, have a counselor, someone to talk to just to process all those things and really, you know, make note of what you have for your coping skills. And certainly those things can be modified. Uh, a lot of our, our patients like to work out and you know, when you're inpatient and recovering from transplant, you might not be able to you know, lift weights or go swimming. So it's saying, okay, well, what can we do to modify that? Uh, and that's where you know, even meditation comes in or, or guided imagery. Uh, there's actually a study that I read uh, years ago that said that when you imagine yourself or visualize yourself going through the motions of something, uh, your muscles are actually getting 40% of the stimulation that they would get if you were physically doing the activity. And that's because of all the muscle memory. You know, our brain is that motherboard that sends everything throughout our bodies. And it's just a way for your body to fire off and say, okay, these are the moves that I need to do. And you'll see that actually with, you know, professional athletes, they go over the plays before they go out on the field or the court. And so that when they go out there, it's just an automatic response. So I, I always joke around with people, I tell them you're not going to lose weight or gain muscle by thinking about the activity, but it does help your body and helps firing it so that when you get back into the activity, it's a little bit easier. And then certainly to finding some sort of, you know, gentle movement to do that physical activity, but not overly exuberant. And that helps to combat the fatigue. So it is looking at, okay, what does my body need for repairing and where is that hurdle that I need to push myself over so that I'm not having those muscles atrophy more and then looking at, you know, different arts and crafts, uh, deep breathing techniques, uh, bubble baths. But of course, too, if you're not able to get in and out of the tub, I always recommend that people just soak their feet in warm water. You can put some Epsom salt in there too, and you can sit at the edge of the tub or even getting a little uh, container or something to soak your feet in while you're watching your favorite movie or <laughs> doing some crafts or something. And that's a nice way to just relaxing the feet will systemically go through your entire body and start to relax you. Uh, practicing gratitude is also a great way for self-care, uh, especially if you worry a lot uh, and have a, a running list in your head. I've had quite a few patients that I've encouraged to put, you know, a notepad next to their nightstand or on their nightstand next to the bed. And before they go to sleep, write down three things they're grateful for from that day. And it doesn't have to be anything extravagant. It could be, I had a refreshing glass of water. It felt like a summer day in the middle of February and it was great. I got to wear you know, a light jacket and had my windows rolled down. Uh, you know, a stranger smiled at me and it just lit up my day. So it's just 
different things for you to look at and go to sleep thinking about those grateful things rather than all those worries and fears. And I've had a lot of patients come back and say, wow, that's really helping me sleep better at night. Uh, I actually had one who he said, I had to write down all of the things that were in my mind first, and then I could write down what I was grateful for. And the first time he did it, he said, I'm grateful that I wrote down all that stuff so I don't have to think about it anymore. So <laughs> it really is, you know, figuring out what will, you know, help you the most and getting to know yourself again yeah. is part of that too, saying, okay, well, these are things that I, I used to do and I'd like to get back into that. Or this is something that helped me before, but it's not really anymore. So I need to adapt or find something else. So one thing that I give to a lot of my patients is this healthy mind platter. So when they meet with uh, the nutrition team, they usually tell yeah. them to eat the rainbow. And this is the rainbow for your brain. So when you, you look at it, it kind of breaks it down. And I, I tell people, you know, there's a lot of overlap in, in these things, but this is a really nice way to, especially if you're, you know, highly organized to really look at it and say, okay, well, what do I need to do to make sure that my brain is functioning at full capacity? You know, my stress levels are down and, yeah, you know, this, wait, oh, no, I don't think um, a lot of these things too are, you know, things that I just talked about with those coping skills. You know, it's looking at that focus time. So that's really your mindfulness practices. Uh, Playtime is one that I really encourage people to do, which you can, you know, couple with the, the connecting time. So a lot of times, especially as adults, we're so caught up in, I need to get from point A to point B, or I have all these projects to do, or, you know, I have to do all this stuff for work and I have the medical stuff now, and you know, I'm balancing my family stuff that we don't really have that downtime. And the playtime really gives you that opportunity to shut off that logical mind that has all those lists running and allows that creative mind to turn on. And play can look like, you know, taking a blank piece of paper and doodling on it or getting out the old board games. I had uh, one patient that just, you know, had some trauma growing up, but never really had a childhood. You know, when she was young, her parents divorced. I think she was about 10 and she went and moved in with her dad and she said she was cleaning the house. She was making all the food. She'd go to school and come home and do all those things. So she went from being 10 to, you know, being, you know, in her late twenties, early thirties, you know, taking care of a house instead of being a kid. So she never really had that opportunity. And her little brother came and lived with them a few years after, and she was raising him too. So when I met with her, she made a comment about her grandchildren wanting her to go outside and play with her. And she just did not understand why? Because she didn't do that as a kid herself. And she's like, I've got dishes to do. I need to clean up, you know, the food, put all this stuff away. So I really encouraged her to try to take a step back uh, from that and, you know, play with the kids. And we at our, our facility, there's a pond and there's a lot of geese that hang out there. And she looked out the window during one of our sessions and said, I really want to go out there and chase the geese. And I looked at her, I said, you know, geese are really territorial and they're mean, but I mean, we can go out there if you want. So we took a little field trip out there and um, she's standing there looking at me and I said, okay, we'll go chase the geese. And she goes, well, I don't really know what to do. I'm like, we'll just run after them. You run after them like your grandkids would. And she's looking at me and and I said, okay, so like this, and I'm running and I'm flailing my arms and legs around just like a little kid would do. And she joined in with me. And the next time I saw her, she had this big smile on her face and she goes, guess what I did? And I said, I have no idea. What did you do? She said, I chased my grandkids instead of doing the dishes and it felt great. So it's taking those moments too to really be present and say, okay, I'm giving myself permission to embrace you know, these things that are really important, you know, the dishes can wait for, you know, an hour or something when you go out and decide to play and have fun and, and have that levity enter your life. Uh, and, you know, it's also giving yourself that permission for downtime. A lot of times we have these running lists and to do lists that, oh, we have to mark everything off before the end of the day. And if I don't, well, you know, that's, you know, just adding to my list for tomorrow. And it's giving yourself that permission to say, okay, you know what, let me look at what the most important thing on this list is and make sure I get that done. And if the other things don't get done, 
tomorrow's another day. And I know that can be really challenging to do. I know even for myself, it can be challenging at times, but it, it is um, just saying, okay, I'm going to give myself that grace today, uh, especially as you're preparing for transplant or recuperating from it, because, you know, our bodies need a lot of time to repair and recuperate from that. And, you know, we're only given 100% of energy. Um, and if you're trying to expel 100% out externally to take care of things where your body's saying, hey, I need 100% internally right now to repair, you're going to have this internal conflict. So it is finding that balance and saying, okay, you know, I used to be able to do 10,000 things, but now I feel that I need to cut that in half and do 5,000 things so that I can rest and recuperate. But once I'm through all of this, my body's back to where it was, I can get back to that 10,000 list. And then here are some quick self-care techniques that uh, I always give people. And these are very simple and things that you can even do in your car while you're waiting for the red light. Uh, the thymus tap is one that a lot of our patients like. The thymus is a little gland, uh, kind of where your collarbones meet, where that little dimple is in your, your chest there. And if you just take your, your fingertips and gently tap it for, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, however long it takes for that light to turn green, that actually helps to boost your immune system. And it, you know, produces T cells that move throughout your entire body. And it's also a way that you're focusing on, you know, that tapping versus I'm sitting in traffic right now, or I have all this anxiety because you're, you're breathing and focusing that way. So that's a nice way to calm the mind instantly. Uh, the quick coherence technique. So this is uh, a technique designed by HeartMath, and they really did a lot of research on, you know, blood pressure and stress and getting the body integrated. And what I like about this is you, for the technique, you put one hand on your heart and I always uh, tell people to put another hand on your abdomen so that you can really feel when you're taking that deep abdominal breath. A lot of times we're breathing in our chest and it makes sense. You know, we can't take those deep diaphragmatic breaths throughout the entire day because you know, it, you're you not going to be as productive. You can't hold a conversation if you're taking a deep breath and then saying all the words and then taking another deep breath. Uh, but it is a, a great way to to take that step back and calm yourself. So with one hand on your abdomen and the other on your heart, it almost feels as though you're giving yourself a hug too. And you can put as much pressure as you'd like or or not. And I know this has helped a lot of my patients that have a little bit more anxiety or that nervousness or worry just to help them center and refocus. And as you're breathing, you just bring to mind, you know, a loving feeling, someone or a place that really means a lot to you. And they've actually found that when you're doing that and you're you're focusing on that breathing and your heart rate, and you can feel that it actually decreases your blood pressure and it syncs your breathing up with your your heart. So that's a, a nice thing you can actually do as a couple too. I've had a lot of my couples, especially if they are feeling disconnected from each other. Uh, face each other and put a hand on each other's heart and start breathing together. And eventually their breathing will sync up completely. Uh, so that's a really neat thing to see too. And then uh, the ear massage. So this is what I tell people all the time is like a party trick if you want to impress your friends. So uh, we hold a lot of stress and tension in our necks. And I always have people, and you can do this if you're not driving your car, if you turn and look behind you as far as you can to your right and see the farthest point you can see, and then do the same on your left, and then rub your earlobe for about 30 seconds to a minute. So we'll just rub our earlobes. And you can go all the way up your ear or just the, the bottom of it. All right. And then look again uh, over your right shoulder as far as you possibly can see. And do the same on your left. And hopefully you have seen an increase in your range of motion. So that's a, a nice way to, to break up a lot of the, the tension and stress that's held in these muscles. Uh, and it, it that too kind of has that ripple effect down, uh, especially uh, now. I mean, we spend a lot of time on computers or on our phones. So we tend to have this 
hunching forward or, you know, even just this um, kind of a caving of our, our chest. So that's a nice way too to open up, you know, the area here and opening up your chest so that you can release a lot of the, the tension and stuff that is held there. And I'm going to open it up now to all of you if you have any questions. <laughs> 